Hello everyone. I made a video on work and tool holding on the metal lathe about a year and a half ago, and it's only right that I finally give the same treatment to the milling machine. Knowledge of all of the various work and tool holding devices available to you can help you make informed decisions about what to use to make your job easier. Intelligent use of all of these options can save you a ton of time when it comes to machining and setup, especially on jobs that require multiple identical parts or lots of tool changes. This is meant to be a broad overview of everything that's available. I have longer videos on a lot of these tools and I'll put links to the individual videos down in the comments and also in a playlist that I'll link to at the end of the video. Anyway, grab a fresh pair of soft jaws, hit that subscribe button, and let's get started. No discussion of tooling is complete without first looking at the different tapers that are used. The taper used on most manual milling machines is the R8 taper, which is seen in most of the tools pictured here. It has a short taper and a keyed straight shank with a 7 16 20 thread in the end for the drawbar. You can find pretty much every type of tool shank there is in an R8 taper, from collets to drill chuck shanks to boring head shanks, and they're all very affordable. The R8 can also be found on some smaller CNC mills, but it's much more common to find variations of the 30, 40, and 50 tapers, with 40 probably being the most common. These tapers are available in a wide variety of flavors, such as CAT, BT, or NMTB, just to name a few. This one happens to be an NMTB 30. Any other tool labeled as a 30 will have the same taper, but there are differences in the flange, and in the case of the NMTB, this short cylindrical bit on the end, which is not there on the others. Because of this, the different styles are not interchangeable. There are some other tapers you might run into out there which are not as common, mostly on older machines, and there are a few manufacturers that use proprietary tapers on their machines as well. Tooling can be very hard to come by for those. Luckily, straight shank tooling is available for drill chucks and boring heads, which is probably the best option for you if you have one of those machines. Let's get into what each of these tools are and what they're used for. Collets and end mill holders both do the same thing. They just go about it in different ways, and each has its advantages and disadvantages. Collets don't take up nearly as much space between the spindle and the workpiece, and they also hold tooling with better concentricity. In addition to end mills, you can also use them to hold edge finders, drills, and any other tooling with a straight shank. The biggest disadvantage to using collets is that the tool is free to move whenever the collet is released so you can't maintain your tool's z-location between tool changes. The tool can also slip out of the collet during heavy cuts if they're not tightened enough. Another excellent option on the collet front are ER collets, which are available in a variety of size ranges with collet chucks for every commonly used taper, as well as straight shanks. These collets have a 1mm clamping range, which makes them exceptionally versatile. I have another video covering these in more detail that I'll link to down in the description. End mill holders, also known as side lock holders in various parts of the world, are way more rigid and are available in a larger range of sizes than collets. The set screw on the side of the end mill holder keeps the cutter from pulling out during a cut, but it should only be used with cutters that have a welded shank, which is this flat in the middle of the shank. That set screw also pushes the tool slightly off center, so concentricity can suffer, which decreases tool life. There are high precision end mill holders available that have a tighter tolerance on the bore to minimize this. Another option are shrink fit end mill holders, which have an undersized bore that's heated to allow the end mill to be slipped in. When the tool holder cools, it shrinks and grips the end mill very tightly with excellent concentricity. These are used extensively in the production world, not so much in the home shop due to the expense. End mill holders are very useful when there are a lot of tool changes to be made, since the tool stick out won't change even though the tool has been removed from the spindle. End mills in larger sizes are often sold as shell mills, basically the cutting edges of an end mill without the shank. This makes them significantly more economical. These are held on a special shank with a drive key called a shell mill holder. The same type of shank is also used for holding face mills. 
Face mills and fly cutters are both used for cutting a wide sweep across the face or surface of a part. Both are available in many different diameters. Face mills use carbide inserts for the cutting edges, and because of the large number of cutting inserts, you can obtain very smooth finishes, even with aggressive feeds. Fly cutters are cheap to buy or easy to make yourself. You can use either a ground high-speed steel tool or a brazed carbide tool. However, feed rates are going to be slower for fly cutters than for face mills because they only have the one cutting edge. Let's move on to all the hole making tools. Drill chucks should be familiar to everyone and are available in both keyed and keyless varieties. They're for holding straight shank drills as well as countersinks, counterbores, taps, and reamers, etc. I should mention that keyless chucks will grip tighter as they're used to drill, but will also loosen under a reverse load, such as reversing with a tap or using a left-handed drill. So in those instances, you should always use a keyed chuck. Drill chucks are labeled by their capacity, and that is the drill size, not the shank size. Yes, that one and a half inch reduced shank bit you have fits in the chuck, but it's almost certainly going to slip and mess up the shank, and you can actually damage the chuck as well. This is especially true of keyless chucks due to that self-tightening feature I mentioned earlier. The chuck will over-tighten because of the extra torque and can break the ball bearings that are inside. If you have a keyless chuck that feels like it has gravel inside, that's probably the reason, and it should be rebuilt. Collets are a far better option for holding reduced shank drills, assuming the shank hasn't already been totally hosed by holding it in a drill chuck. You should also never use a drill chuck to hold an end mill. They don't hold securely or concentrically enough, and the end mill shank is harder than the chuck jaws, so they can be damaged. The taper shank drill adapter allows you to use the range of larger drills that have a Morse taper shank. These can be very handy, however, between the length of the holder and the drill length, it's very easy to run out of room between the spindle and the part, especially if your part's larger than your average kitten. The Morse number no. 2 adapter isn't too bad, but for Morse number no. 3 and above, the taper shank is too large to fit within the shape of the R8 taper, so it actually extends out quite a ways instead. This ends up making it quite long indeed. A boring head is used to accurately enlarge an existing hole. A boring bar is held in any of the three hole positions on the head and is offset using the graduated screw on the side. The graduations on most read on the diameter, meaning if you move this dial 25 thousandths of an inch, your hole will increase by 25 thousandths of an inch. Let's finish up the tooling discussion with stub arbors. These are used to hold slitting saws, gear cutters, as well as the wide variety of milling cutters generally used on the horizontal milling machine. The arbor consists of a keyed shaft, which mates up with a keyway on the cutter, a number of spacers to put the cutter in the desired position, and then a nut to lock it all together. By far, the most common work holding option on the mill is the vise. It's used for probably 90% of what I do at least and most work can be held with the jaws in the inboard position like this. However, for machining larger workpieces, the jaws can be unbolted and moved to the outboard position. Soft machinable jaws can also be installed in the vise to make work locating simpler and quicker for multiple parts or for providing a more secure grip on smaller parts. Soft jaws are commercially available in different heights, lengths, and thicknesses to accommodate parts of all sizes. They can also just be made in the shop out of any suitably sized pieces of aluminum or mild steel. While vices are suitable for the vast majority of work, I would really like to encourage people to think outside the vise as well. Sometimes people get stuck in their ways and try to hold things in a vise when the job might be held easier in another way. I used to have a coworker that never removed the vise for any reason. He would try to hold everything in it. 8 foot long pump shafts, round castings, I even saw him clamp a piece down to the table while it was sitting on top of the vise. I don't know if he just didn't want to lift it or sweep it back in when he was done. Maybe he thought it was part of the machine and couldn't be taken off. 
Whatever the reason, he made a lot more work for himself by trying to fit parts in the vise that should have been put on the table or on a fixture. Any repetitive work on a mill can be made simpler through the use of a stop. The purpose of any stop is to provide a positive, repeatable location for all of your parts to bear against. A vise stop like this one clamps over one of the jaws, preferably the fixed jaw since it's not the one moving around. The table stop is larger and mounted at a convenient spot anywhere on the table. These are very versatile. They can be used for parts that are in the vise, sticking out from the vise, or clamped down to the table as well. The beauty of using a stop is that you only need to find the edges on the first part and can expect all subsequent parts to be in that location as well. I generally trust mine to be repeatable within two thousandths of an inch, but in practice it's usually much closer. If this is acceptable given the tolerances on your part, then the use of a stop can greatly speed up machining. Parallels are essential for raising the part above the vise jaws so it can be machined. Without them, the machinist would constantly be drilling holes into the vise or snapping end mills on the vise jaws. They're available in a variety of thicknesses, and which one you use depends entirely on the shape of the part and the location of any holes in the part. Thin parallels like these should be used when holes need to be drilled close to the edge and the drill would come into contact with a normal size pair of parallels. Thicker parallels can be used when it's not necessary to drill holes through the part or at least none close to the edge. Parallels can also be wavy which helps keep them from falling down when you set up your part in the vise. These are useful for supporting relatively thin work and can compress as the vise jaw is closed upon them. Angle blocks are used to set parts at an angle in the vise so you don't have to tilt the head of your machine. They come in sets with a variety of angles, and usually 1 through 5 degrees will be in 1 degree increments, and then from there to 30 will be in 5 degree increments. Of course, you also have your complementary angles, so this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Some sets will also have a quarter and half degree block, and you can use these to add or subtract to each other. So I can take my 30 degree block and my 4 degree block and put them together like this for 34 degrees. Or I can turn the 4 degree block around to subtract from that and it makes it 26 degrees. I have a video discussing these in depth and I'll put a link to that one in the description. 1, 2, 3 blocks are hardened steel blocks that nominally measure 1 by 2 by 3 inches. These are useful for a number of setups such as raising parts off the mill table, layout work, checking calibration of depth micrometers, and a host of other uses. The limit is only set by your imagination. There are several variations on 1, 2, 3 blocks, and the most common is this kind with holes all over. Some of these holes are tapped, and I believe the idea was that you'd be able to assemble them into small angle plates and squares, but on the imported ones, the non-tapped holes are not clearance holes for the tapped ones, so that doesn't work too well. There is a workaround that I'm planning on showing in a future video, but I haven't gotten around to making that yet. And the tapped holes can also still be used as fixtures. Uh, you can put this in the vise and bolt an oddly shaped piece or a very small piece down to it. You can hold it at an angle. You can do all sorts of stuff with them. They're also less commonly sold as either solid blocks or blocks with a single hole right through the 2x3 face. Both of these are nicer to use on the surface grinder since the coolant and grinding grit doesn't collect in all the holes like on this style. They're always sold as matched pairs and are quite accurate in squareness and flatness, but not necessarily size. The 1, 2, and 3 inch dimensions can actually be a bit over or undersized, so before you use it to zero a micrometer or offset a part, make sure you know what the actual dimension is. This is one of those tools that every machinist should have one or two sets of in their toolbox, and they're not very expensive at all. They also have a larger version in a 2, 4, 6 block, and they have metric blocks as well. No milling machine is complete without a set of step clamps. The set contains all of the T-nuts, threaded studs, step blocks, clamps, and nuts that you might possibly need to hold anything onto the mill table. The steps allow you to have a lot of height adjustment to match your part. You need to make the clamp as parallel to the table as possible so everything is solid and won't shift. 
Blocks can be used singly or in pairs. Also, caution should be used when tightening the clamps as it is possible to break chunks out of the T-slots if you tighten them too much. The last thread of the T-nut is normally incomplete or purposely damaged to keep the stud from going all the way through to avoid this. Otherwise, it could come through and act like a jack between the bottom and top of the T-slot and blow a big chunk out of your table. I'll often put pieces of brass between my clamps on the workpiece to keep from marring the surface, especially if I'm clamping on something round like a shaft. Speaking of shafts, when I need to cut a keyway in one, I generally clamp it directly to the table and use the T-slot to locate it. This method keeps the shaft aligned to the travel of the table and acts like a giant V-block. This makes everything way more solid than holding it in a vise where you only have two thin points of contact along the length of the vise jaws. Also, misalignment of the vise can cause issues with the keyway placement. Angle plates are useful for parts that don't fit in the vise or are oddly shaped. They're available in different sizes and grades of accuracy. Machined plates like this one have much wider squareness and parallelism tolerances than ground plates of the same size. Parts are held onto the plate in any convenient way, including bolting, clamping, special fixtures, etc. Really, anything goes as long as it orients the part correctly and holds it securely. The plates are usually held to the table with step clamps or threaded studs. Again, whatever's convenient. Fixture plates have no definite shape or size, but instead are made up depending on your needs. They can be made out of any handy material, but most often aluminum is used due to its low cost and ease of machining. If used for large runs of parts, steel might be considered instead, especially if it'll be necessary to install and remove screws for each part, since threads in aluminum can be stripped out easily. For quick, sacrificial fixtures, especially for one-off parts where no coolant will be used, you can use plywood or MDF, which is medium density fiberboard. This is exceptionally flat, so it's a really good option for quick and dirty fixtures. The key feature of a fixture is that it provides a repeatable location for your part, if multiple parts are needed, and doesn't interfere with the machining operation. The repeatability can be achieved using dowel pins to form three points of contact or machining a pocket into the fixture itself. They're considered sacrificial in most cases, so the fixture is bolted to the table or held in a vise, the part is bolted to the fixture, and it really doesn't matter at all if you cut into the fixture while machining your part. Let's look at indexing devices. Indexing refers to the ability to move the part a measurable amount without disturbing your setup. This is useful when placing evenly spaced features around the circumference or face of a part, such as wrench flats, gear teeth, or bolt holes. But it's also used to machine features at a certain angular distance from one another. The two main tools for this are the dividing head and the rotary table. But there are also simple devices like collet blocks to get the most commonly needed indexings without the hassle of all the setup. The dividing head can be used to cut gears, graduations, splines, wrench flats, or any feature you can imagine around the circumference or the face of the part. The rotary table is similarly versatile and can be used to machine radii or features at angles to one another. You can mount fixture plates directly to the table, or you can actually mount chucks to them as well. Many rotary tables can be mounted both horizontally and vertically, and most dividing heads can be set at an angle from 10 degrees below horizontal to 90 degrees vertically. I have a playlist of videos on indexing devices that I'll link to down in the description. If you have any questions about this or any other machining topics, ask them down in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Who knows, I may even make a video about it. Hit the like and subscribe buttons while you're down there, and maybe consider supporting the channel over on Patreon like the amazing people that you can see on your screen right now. Like I said, I have links to more detailed videos on some of these tools down in the description, and I've also put them into a playlist that you can see on the right side of your screen. I have the corresponding lathe video to this one in the top left, and my most recent video in the bottom left. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.